Life is art. Art is life. This is Classic Talk with Bing and Dennis, coming to you from New York. Thanks for being with us today on Classic Talk with Bing and Dennis. Our guest today is the captivating Italian bass baritone Luca Pizzaroni, known throughout the world for his singing of Mozart, Rossini, and Baroque operas. Welcome, Luca. Uh, thank you for having me. Hi. Well, thank you to have some time for us. Well, tell me though, I know that you travel probably 11 months of the year. Kind of. And yes. uh, are you used to it? Uh, actually, yes. Uh, I am used to it. I love it. Uh, you know, don't call me the day of the traveling because, you know, moving five suitcases, a wife and two dogs is not really fun, <laughs> especially when you have to go through, you know, security at the airport. But I, we actually love it because we travel together and it feels to me like I'm taking a piece of my home with me everywhere I go. So I know that a lot of my colleagues feel like it's tiring to be on the road, mm -hmm. but for me it's not I don't feel that because it's, for me, anywhere we are, it's home for it's me. Home. As long as my wife is with me and the dogs are with me, I'm, it's home for me. So it okay. can be a hotel in San Francisco, a house, in, apartment in Paris or in London, and it's home. So I'm used to it. I love it, and actually I like to change uh, scenario that often. And I like that in every city I go, I have some friends and I get to see them. So it's not, for me, it's never been a problem. And actually, I'm lucky because even my dogs love to travel. So <laughs> no how, how many years have you been on the road? Now? Uh, now it's been professional. I've been singing for 12 years, which is unbelievable wow. because it feels like I started yesterday. And yet mm -hmm. it's, it's been, you know, such a long time. And, and you still love it. I love it. I really do. You know, as I told you, the day of the traveling, when, you know, after a concert and you are tired, you have to get up at 5.30 because you need to take the first fly in the morning to go somewhere else. And then I'm not going to be very friendly in the morning. Mm -hmm. But in general, I love it. You yeah. have two dogs. I have two dogs. I have wow. a big one, a golden retriever, and a small one, a miniature dachshund. And they are phenomenal because as soon as I take out the suitcase, they are both jumping into the suitcase to make sure <laughs> they, they are part of the, you know, right. of the traveling plans. And uh, it's so funny because, you know, we, we put the, the stuff into the suitcase and then we are like, where is the, the Tristan is our mini introduction. Where is Tristan? And he's in the suitcase sleeping and making sure like oh, I am right. coming. I don't know where you're going, great. but I'm coming. So it's great. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I understand that you were born in Venezuela. I was born in South America, yes. And is I'm Italian though. It's, I was I I was there. My parents actually lived there for 10 years. Mm -hmm. So I I um I was born there by chance, I would mm -hmm. say. And I we came back when I was 4 years old. My parents stayed 10 years. And uh, at a certain point my mother said, "Look, they need to go to school and uh, um, we need to decide. Either we stay here and they go to school here or we go back to Italy. And I have to say I'm eternally grateful to my mother that we actually went, moved back to Italy because actually I grew up in Buseto, you know, Giuseppe Verdi's hometown. So I got exposed, quote unquote, to opera Since fairly soon. Yes. Practically, I started singing, I mean, listening to opera since I was eight. So uh, I'm not sure I would have become an opera singer had I stayed in, in Venezuela. So was I, it your father's business or his working that took yes, you to visit Venezuela? Yes, it was my father who would own a, a, how you call it, a shop, a company, and he had to move there for 10 years. And then we came back, and I'm grateful because my grandfather was an opera lover, and so he was the one introducing me to opera. And from that moment on, I, I decided that's what I want to do. You know, from really, it's kind of weird because actually at 11 years old, I was 11 when I decided to become an opera You're singer. kidding. I'm, I'm not. <laughs> your I'm voice not, had, I know people, your people voice, think Your I'm voice crazy, hadn't even changed at that I point. I know, but, um, you know, I, the first piece of music I ever listened to was Ella Giamma Mo uh, from Don Carlo with Boris Christoph. And I thought, I couldn't believe a voice could, you know, a human voice could be that big, that dark, uh, how a man can produce that sound. Mm -hmm. And I was immediately fascinated. And after that, I bought my first recording of Pavarotti, mm. and that was it. 
I was immediately in love with uh, with the uh, you know with the opera world, with how you can express feeling throughout the uh, you know with your voice, and and at eleven I saw actually a commercial on TV with Pavarotti singing, and I decided that's it, that's what I want to do. And, uh, you know, I am actually lucky that I have a voice because I'm sure a lot of people at 11 said, I want to be an astronaut. <laughs> but, you know, you need to have, you know, yeah. in, in my case, the voice to be able to sing. And I, I was lucky enough to have a voice. Did you sing as a boy soprano then? Actually, you're not going to believe this either because I never had a boy voice. <laughs> at 12, 13 and 14, I was a tenor. Actually, I have recordings of me singing in Lucien Le Stelle, all the Ballo uh, in Mascara, Ma Seme Forza Perdeti, all the tenor repertoire. I never had a, you know, a boy voice. I always had a normal voice. And, uh, and then at a certain point around 15, 16, I realized that I was changing and I could not reach anymore the tessitura of a tenor. And so Carlo Bergonzi, Told, suggested that I shut up for a couple of years until I changed my voice. And then when I finally was 18, around 18, I realized that my tenor voice was gone. And mm. I cried and cried and really? cried because I already, really always wanted to be a tenor because I love the tenor repertoire, especially, you know, the, the Verdi uh, tenor, you know, it's it's phenomenal repertoire for me. And then I found out, you know, bass baritone. And I thought, well, it could be much worse. So, <laughs> you know, it could be much worse. So it's not that bad. Is your parents um, supporting you when you were growing up? Um, yes. I have to say um, they were very supportive. And uh, I think they had a period that they thought, both, uh, they thought, ah, this is not going to last. <laughs> but then they saw how um, in love with the art form I was. Because, you know, I was going to school. And I would, you know, every almost every Sunday, I would take the train, go to a different city in North Italy, see a performance, and come back in the evening. Mm -hmm. And I never had a passion for disco music or f soccer. Mm -hmm. So it, all, all the Sunday, instead of going to the soccer game, I would go and see an opera. Uh, and so they realized that I really had a passion for it. So when I uh, decided to study music in Milano, the conservatorio, they completely understood. And when I actually told them that I needed to go to South America to study with, a, with the tenor I met in Milano, mm -hmm. my father immediately said, how much money do you need to go there? And it, which, honestly, it was, I was in, surprised too, because I thought he would say, ah, I don't think you should go. Instead, he instead was really incredibly supportive. And this is, you know, I'm lucky because it doesn't happen everywhere. Okay. That they understand what I want to do, and also they have the money to help me with this. Because let's face it, to become an opera singer is really costly. Mm -hmm. Because you need to pay for all these lessons, you know. Are you the only child? No, I have a sister. Oh, but she's, she's not. No, she's not into music. No, she's not into music. So you went when you went back. You went to Buenos Aires. To I Southern went to Buenos Aires. For and a year. how did that work out? Was it it worked out very well because I I met this tenor in uh, in Milano by chance, and in, and you know let me let me tell you something. I was studying in Conservatorio Milano and I had a teacher, and I was incredibly unhappy with her, because. I was not singing the way I wanted to be. I always had an idea. And one thing I always want is it has to look easy. Look easy. If it doesn't <laughs> look easy and it, it doesn't feel easy, I think it's wrong. Because I don't want the I want the audience to actually enjoy and feel I'm under control, then oh my god, is he gonna is make it? Gonna make it? <laughs> and I always, and at that time I was really struggling and I was really unhappy and I thought I don't, you know, I can see that I'm making an effort. And this guy, this tenor from Argentina, Renato Sassola, said to me, yeah, I could be much easier. And I immediately connected with him. And we had a few lessons in Milano. And then he said to me, I have to go back to Buenos Aires. And I said, would you mind me to come and work with you? And he said, of course not. I would love that. And a friend of mine, a pianist from La Scala, uh, told me the most important thing that, and I always repeat this to everybody. He said to me, he said to me, nobody cares where you study. 
as long as you know how to sing. Because the first question when you sing an audition is, what would you like to sing? Nobody cares where you study, with whom, you know, how many degrees you have. As long as you know how to sing. And so that was for me the moment I said, okay, I'm going. And I spent a year in Buenos Aires. And actually, I'm, I'm very pleased that I did it because I... You know, I learned my technique before actually st starting to work professionally. You know, the first engagement was actually Figaro, was my debut. Can you imagine? Where was that? In Klagenfurt, in, in Austria. In Klagenfurt. <laughs> and, and, you know, it was my debut, title role. And I said, I really need to know what I'm doing before I, you know, I just go there and sing this incredible, long and difficult role. So I used this year in Buenos Aires to actually hone my craft and you know when I arrived there at least I didn't know everything but I knew that the sounds would come out you know <laughs> that was my main thing that's amazing so you really feel that after that year and you feel confident you feel comfortable with your voice and the way you sing you know uh, yes you know for that time uh, and you think I was uh, 25 when I went mm -hmm. you know at that time I you know it really changed the way I thought about singing, you know, because it was, he always focused on two points. Easy, as little as effort as possible, L try to achieve the maximum result in terms of quality of sound, resonance with the least effort. And one thing that I'm always grateful, sing with your voice. Don't try to sound bigger or darker, just use right. your instrument, right. which, right. you know, I also now tend sometimes to forget because especially in a theater like the Met, you see the size and you think, oh my God, I really need to push. Instead, you just have to use your own instrument. And because I believe your voice will develop if you let it grow naturally. If you try to push it somewhere, it will not grow as, you know, as fast and as beautiful as you think it, it, it could. So I, I, I went there and when I come back, I was a different singer. Mm -hmm. But I am aware that, you know, that this profession, it's incredible because you actually never stop studying and learning. Right. And, you know, I'm one of the singers who, I, I never, I don't, I trust my judgment, but I think having somebody outside who helps you, it's really important. Because what I hear and what I think is my voice is not necessarily what you hear outside. And sometimes, you know, I think I sing the best note ever. And, <laughs> and my, my, my coach says, oh, that was okay. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes I think it was the worst, oh, not the sensation that I wanted to hear. And he tells me That's, that note was the best note you have ever done. So you are, I think, I believe you need somebody from outside who says, you know, the phrasage is not really good. That note was not really, had no all the resonance and uh, it's a work in pro progress. You know, people, a lot of time, I think students think, you know, they get a degree and that's it. And actually, I think it's a starting point. The yeah. degree gives you a basic amount of tools to enter the working of force. You know, from that moment on, you really need to work. Do you still have a voice teacher? Oh, that you go God, to yes. Here in New York? Or I where? have somebody in New York and I have somebody in Austria. You know, and I always say, um, you need to pick four people in your life whom you trust at all times and work with them. Because, you know, if you tr tend to listen to too many people, you tend to lose a little bit your way. But if you have a great collaboration with a couple of people, just trust them and work with them. Because I think they help you, you know, find solution and, uh, you know, be better. When was the first time you came to New York or to America? I came in 2003. And I came because my wife... Uh, was uh, studying here. She was doing a master at Parsons. Wow. And so, you know, we met in Salzburg. I was singing Mazzetto. And, and, and then she said to me, yeah, but I live in New York. And I said, yeah, 
there are planes. I can. <laughs> I was like, I can. I don't think she was so into me coming here, but I was pushy. So I said, oh, I can come. And uh, I came here and my agent said, would you like to have an audition at the Met? I said, well, I'm here. Why not? And I remember I had an audition in Sea Level with Jonathan Friends. And they asked me the following day to have an audition with Maestro Levine. This was 2003? On stage. And I remember like it was yesterday because I was, I was so nervous. How was it? It was uh, <laughs> it was scary because, you know, when I was an adolescent, I used to listen to the uh, radio broadcast from the Met on Saturday night, right. and it was always you know Pavarotti, blah blah blah, Levine conducting, and so to get a chance for me to sing in front of Levine was like I cannot I couldn't believe it. So I went, I walked on stage and um, thank God it was all dark because the Met can be <laughs> very intimidating from, you That's know, right. if you look from the stage to the auditorium. Right. And I remember I sang Figaro and then I sang actually the Cabaletta from Alidoro. Ah. And, uh, and then a week later they asked me to do to be part of his Clemenza di Tito in 2005 as Publio. Mm -hmm. And they said, would you consider it? And I, my reply to my agent was, are you kidding? Of full time <laughs> I'm doing it because I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. You probably much. would say, oh, let me check my schedule. And no, no. <laughs> I tell you, those, those were the moments where I said yes as soon as it inquired met. I didn't care what was the role. I said, you know, to get a chance to work, you know, with, with, with him here, I thought, you know, you know, it's unbelievable, you know. I've been lucky because I made my debut in, in Salzburg at 26 with Arnold Kur conducting, and, you know, and then after that, you know, I got a chance to work with Levine, and, no, you know, those are those kind of conductors who change your life, you know, because you learn so much from them, and they make you such a better musician and a better singer. So I was, I you know, for me it was heaven, you know heaven to be here and work with Levine. One of the, you know, the good conductors always kind of not only take care of you, but breathe with you. That is... That's the amazing thing about Levine, for example. Levine is somebody who doesn't necessarily need to look at you, but he listens to you. And that's, I think, is a quality very few have. You know, Levine is one of those conductors who anticipate your mistake, which I don't know how he does it, but if there is like a difficult moment, he knows it before you do actually, mm -hmm. and he's with you, guiding you through the difficult moment. And the other thing is that he knows when you are in a good voice or a good day, and he allows you to, I don't know, to do a largando on a high note because right. he knows you. And when he feels that maybe it's not your best day, it keeps moving and that's priceless. And and um, let me tell you another thing, Levine is also one of the last who know so much, who know so much about voices. He can actually, he is far, uh, f you know, for me first and foremost, a phenomenal coach. He, when, uh, you know, I, a musical uh, rehearsal with him, it's like, six months of working with a normal pianist mm. on a on a on a on a, on a, on a role. Mm -hmm. It is I what I learn from him about, you know, fraseggio and singing and and uh, you know how to, you know, um, give a sound how to you know help, you know, the the legato in in Publio. I remember I Nobody, I coached that piece so many times, but nobody's ever told me as much as he did. So is you know, it is, it's fantastic. Yeah. I think Dennis probably know that very well. Oh, I also found that in the moments when things did go wrong, some conductors tend to panic and make it even worse. I agree. And I've seen Levine so many times, if things start falling apart, he stays absolutely cool and does the minimal amount that's needed to get things back together. And that's what, as a, as a singer, you need, you know, because you know that you've made a mistake or, some, you know, you're not in good voice or whatever. And, you, you know, as a singer, you tend to go, oh, my God, oh, my God. And you need there somebody who actually you know, keeps look, smiling at you and saying, it will be fine. Right. You know, I'm here with you. And that's really makes things so much better. Instead of someone who just starts getting Yeah, and also the other <laughs> thing I love is that when we are not together and they go, 
And you're yeah. like, yeah, but that doesn't that really help me. <laughs> I know I'm, you know, I'm not in the right spot, but it doesn't really tell me where I'm supposed to come in. And this is, you know, that's a huge difference with, with him. I, you know, there are not that many, you know, and... Uh, Do you I, remember the first, your debut at the Met? Oh, yeah, I remember. Oh, yeah, of course. I remember it was Anne-Sophie von Otter, it was Sarah Connolly, Frank Lopardo and Melanie Diener. And I remember, actually, I remember the dress rehearsal because it was an open dress rehearsal. So it was actually for me the moment to be uh, on the stage of the mat with an audience. And I remember um, during my aria, Maestro Levine was conducting. And I think I did probably a phrase without taking a breath where Norman I did and it sounded good. And I remember him looking up and giving me such a huge friendly smile. <laughs> and I thought, oh, I can die now, <laughs> you know, and I'm gonna be happy because, you know, the truth is that with somebody like him, the only thing you wanna do is to make him happy. Okay. You know, to have a smile like him from, from, from him, from the pit, it's just the best, the most rewarding thing that you can hope for. Rewarding and makes you sing better, even better. When... That's the thing. That's the thing, it's divine pushes you to be the best singer that you can possibly be. Let's hear a little bit of music. Um, one of your best roles, or many roles, is Leporello and Don Giovanni. Madamina, il catalogo è questo, delle belle che amò il padron mio, un catalogo vegliete o fattivo, osservate, leggete con me, Osservate, leggete con me. In Italia 640, Villa Magna 231, Centro in Francia e Turchia 91, ma in Spagna, ma in Spagna. Great. Tell, this is from the Met, Don Giovanni, what year? Uh, 2011. How many times have you sung La Porello? Not that, ma uh, not that many times. I sang much more Figaro than actually La uh -huh. Porello, but I have to say La Porello is one of my favorite roles. It, I just love this guy. It's, 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 it's probably of the Mozo da Ponte, I have to say, we, together with the, with the Count, my favorite role. I love La Porello because he's such a normal guy who's, you know, trying to survive, you know, you know and try to, and he tries to witness something exceptional through the life of Don Giovanni. And so for him just to be around and witness this, this incredible force that, that Don Giovanni is, it's, it's, it, it makes him incredibly happy. And I always think Madamina for me, it's, the the high point of of uh, Leporello of the evening of Leporello because it's is this little Don Giovanni moment. Finally, he can actually talk about this catalog, and he has been working on it forever. forever yeah. And he is so proud, and he's he has done so much to keep it and in details. So the moment that Don Giovanni says, "Oh yeah, tell everything," it goes like, "I can believe yes. he just said that." <laughs> so and it's it for him is a great moment. I don't think he's particularly nice to her. Uh, because he goes really into details, but it's for him. It's like it's it's energetic and full of yeah. excitement. Hold that moment. note. Hold that note. We have to take a break. But we're here on Classic Talk with Bing and Dennis, speaking with Luca Pizzaroni today. 